Hello and welcome to Broads and Books. I'm Amy. And I'm Erin. And this is episode 110. It's my life. It's my life. This my came life. from a band called Talk Talk. It did. In the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Covered infamously by No Doubt. Love that cover. Not so lie good. To you. So good. Yeah. So, so good. I like the song. I like the idea of thinking about, you know, doing the most with your one life. Yeah. It's my life, damn it. It is my life. I want to do what I want to do in my life. Yes. Don't but you still forget. Make, still make money. And right. still, you know. I still want to have, have luxuries. Nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to buy my cat's scratching posts. Well, and, that's you know, just necessary. That's and allow them to look out the want. window that's to. Neat. Yeah. To watch the birds and. Yeah. Dream about murdering them, which is what's happening right now as, you know, sometimes warmer weather is coming. If you can't dream about murdering something, <laughs> are you even American? I mean. No, the answer is no. Yeah. You're not. That is the actual American dream. Just mm-hmm. murder it will. Murder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep. Well, yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's good to know that uh, I was going to ask you about your passions and your hopes and your dreams. And I think we've just uncovered them. Yep. So if you could do anything in your life, you would just want to murder, I guess. Just murder. Okay. Well, just get away with murder. Mm-hmm. Well, on that vein, uh-huh. I mean, maybe murder would make you happy. Maybe. You hear a lot. Do what makes you happy. And I imagine this is thrown around in relationship talk, mm-hmm. in life talk, mm-hmm. in work talk. Mm-hmm. I want to know, Aaron, mm-hmm. do you think that's good or bad advice? First of all. I want to go back to the origin. And oh. I feel like if you if you track it back, I feel fairly confident what you'll find is like some 20-something white guy yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. on a stage uh-huh. with Teva sandals <laughs> and a microphone being like, you got to do what makes you happy. You got to do it. This is easy. Life? It's yeah. easy. Yeah. That's why I started Cliff bars and then you're like oh okay so you have billions of dollars but you're that's like that's why i started with my trust fund yes it's that's easy what I, did. I told my dad i don't want to sell stocks i got an idea for granola and you're like i can't i cannot that's why it's bad advice because yeah uh, first of all it's not possible for everyone second of all fundamentally doesn't make sense and no one means that Mm-mm. this is a small example but like i feel a tremendous amount of guilt when the weather's nice if I don't spend time outside. Oh my God, me too. And I'm not an outdoorsy person. Me neither. So if I follow do what makes me happy, it would be I'm going to sit inside and read and have some snacks. Yes. I might watch a show. Yeah. I might not get out of my pajamas. I'm going to look out the window at the prettiness. Sure. But I'm going to stay inside. Right. And by this philosophy, that should be fine. But everything else in society tells me that I'm a couch potato Mm -hmm. that doesn't deserve anything good. (laughs) So how am I supposed to do what makes me happy? It's a very good point, though, because it's supposed to be what society deems worthwhile. And right. That makes do you happy. Do what makes you happy under these parameters. Yes. So if you have to put a caveat on it, then it's not really a true statement, yeah. right? Do what makes you happy. Yeah. Okay. Also, there's a lot of things that would make me happy that are not okay. <laughs> They're just not okay. Such as what, Erin? Like losing my mind oh. m- constantly in stores. Yeah, Just yeah, yeah. exactly what I want to say whenever I want to say it. Oh my God. That's a good point. If we were to do what would make us happy, we would say things that would get us fired, that would get us thrown out of stores. Mm -hmm. that would get us blacklisted by most people in our lives most harmony would be just deconstructed in a matter of hours (laughs) because there's just no i'm doing what makes me happy yeah and in this moment your pain makes me happy yeah it's not pretty but it's true i sorry so i don't think you should run around telling people to do what makes them happy unless you're prepared for the consequences yeah for what will happen they are swift and severe yeah it's going to be like the purge Oh, yes. It and is. also just a lack of passive aggressiveness, just full on aggressiveness. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's it's just this idea, too, that we're taking something that's entirely unattainable and making it seem so simple. Just do what makes you happy. Just do what makes you happy. Just, again, one of those things you hear from people that you're like, oh, really? Oh, uh-huh. okay. Yeah. Huh. I think it's also a very flawed idea with women because we are constantly told to value others' needs above mm-hmm. our own. So sometimes we don't even know what the hell will make us happy. Yeah. Like, just leave me alone and maybe I can figure it out. Mm-hmm. And do what makes me happy, then I don't ever want to... Abs- uh, live by any of your beauty standards or ideas Hell or anything. No. But then so, if you start doing that, oh God, you've given up. And I have are, given up. Yeah, uh-huh. I've given up. Yeah. And then it then it's not a surprise when your husband leaves you because you gave <laughs> up. Your t- kids don't talk fault. to you. You gave up. Really what should make you happy is 
4 a.m. workouts every day. Every day. And starving Manic. yourself. Manic. Manic. I agree with everything you said. I'm sorry. I think it's spot on. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Yeah. And kind of in that vein, this gets said sometimes too. Follow your passion. Mm-hmm. How does that make you feel? Have you ever been told to follow your passion? Absolutely. I think we're always told to follow our passion, especially in the advent of social media in Mm -hmm. which everyone is, Mm -hmm. follow your dreams Mm -hmm. and give yourself affirmation to follow your passion. But again, I feel like it's coming from a place of, you know, for lack of a better word, privilege. Like it feels like people who are saying that think you have a support system to fall back on or money to fall back on. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some way that you are going to be supported while you figure out what your passion is and you figure out how to make it a reality. Yeah. You know, also, I think so many of our passions are things that are devalued by society, such as art, music, writing, all that right. kind of stuff. So you're yeah. not going to make a living. So no. how are you supposed to follow your passion? Yes. It is contradictory. It is full of flaws. Yes. And it's unrealistic. I also feel like most of the time the people that, especially on social media, that are shouting about following your passion mm-hmm. are trying to sell me moldy leggings. <laughs> it's like, I, I feel like right around the corner is a pyramid scheme every it's absolutely time. absolutely true. You can have freedom. You can work from home. You can follow your passion by helping other women <laughs> find financial freedom. All you have to do is fleece them for thousands of dollars and... Ghost them once they figure out what's going on. Yes. I think that's part of it Mm -hmm. is, you know, women, especially women that may not have many options. It feels like following a passion is someone gives you a route like that. You're like, sure. Great. Cool. Yay. Except it's a cult. It's a cult. It's a MLM scam. Scam. I was trying to think of some of the words that we came up with with scams. Boondoggle. No, boondoggle wasn't one, but I like that. <laughs> it wasn't, but it is now. Flim flam. Flim flam artist. Flim flam artist. Yep. Yeah. That's what more. they're asking you to be. Like your passion is to be a flim flam artist. Yeah. Come you don't want to do that. Come on. I also feel like that's something that we do such a disservice to our younger generations. Yeah. When we act like you have to find this thing that you're going to love. Listen, work is work. Work is work. Even if you love it, sometimes you're going to hate it. Yeah. And that's just facts. So stop trying to be like, you know, I'm going to find this one thing, this one career that's going to make me happy and I'm never going to work a day in my life. Mm-hmm. Shut up. That's I not think, a thing. Yeah. I think it's also a, a lack of definition of what happy is. Like I yes. think so many of us are told like we got to be happy every minute of every day. Yes. And if you're not, then something is really wrong. Yeah. Whereas that's not, that's not life. No. And also, we're not just in a constant state of glee. I may find myself contented. Yes. And that sometimes is as close as happy as I can get. Right. And feels like the most steady of happy. Correct. And it, it ignores that maybe to really do things that you love, you might have to strike a balance. Yeah. Like like you mentioned, you, you know, we do devalue art, writing, those types of things. So if that's something you really want to pursue, most people have to do that after a secondary career. Absolutely. As a side gig. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you just got to follow your passion, Erin. It'll all just work out. <sighs> you got to manifest it. Someday. You got to just say it out into the universe and it will happen. I told myself that this was going to be the year that my dream board was going to come true, <laughs> but... It turns out to have a dream board, you actually have to put a dream board together. You can't just say that was on my dream board retroactively. That's a lot of work. It is. And cutting and pasting and like. No. Yeah. No. And I don't care how many times like I manifest some attractive guy. That's not happening. (laughs) That's not. I can't just put it on my dream board. So if I just, if I'm manifesting Sebastian Stan, he's not just going to come. I don't. And hang so. out with me. Yeah. Bummer. Just like I've been manifesting Keith Morrison and I hanging out. Yeah, that's true. It's not working. It's not working. Mm-hmm. He keeps blowing up bigger and bigger. Yeah. And I keep getting further and further away from that bubble. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think you just got to think about it harder. You yeah. got to manifest harder. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It's definitely failure on my part. <laughs> yep. <It really> is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, think about this, Aaron. Everlasting life. Ooh. One life that goes on forever. Yeah. I mean, you might have time then to pursue your passions and to things that do the things that would make you happy. Uh huh. If you had a chance to be immortal, would you take it? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, 
Uh, yes. That was a, oh. the, your lips were forming the word no. yes and no at the same time. Yeah, because yeah. I want there to be a caveat. I'm not okay. entirely sure how to define immortal. So here's okay. what the caveat has to be. Yeah. If I die, I can immediately pop back to life in that exact same situation. Huh. So like somebody shoots me, boom, I'm immediately back on my Whoa, feet. Whoa, okay. That's In that scenario, yes, because I think the satisfaction I would get from people being... <laughs> completely <laughs> flummoxed by everything that just happened would outweigh it. Otherwise, it sounds like a jail sentence to me. Yeah, it does. Because think of how long in life it takes you to figure things out. And I'm going to do that repeatedly because oh, not everyone around me is immortal. So I'm going to just yeah. keep having different families and dealing with different people. And and you have to keep adapting to the world as it changes. Yes. And it's just constant And nobody's going to understand when you're like, back in my day, yeah. we didn't have this because I'm talking like... <laughs> Thousands. Back in the 2000s. Yeah, like yeah. way long ago. Yeah. But I would be okay with that if I could frequently walk into situations, no fear, and no, I would just immediately pop back to life. So your desire to be immortal is fueled by spite and confusion. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like the idea that I could just go anywhere at any time and not be afraid. And then if something happened, I could yeah. just be like, whoops. Yeah. Look what happened to you. I like, maybe there's... So in some like superhero and, and, you know, sci-fi movies, there's like a distinction between being killed and being immortal. So maybe there's some sort of language right. here we can figure out for you. That's what where I mean. You can, yeah. yeah. You can choose if you want to pop back up and surprise the person. Right. Or be like, peace out. I'm done with this shit. This is over. It's yeah. over for me. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I get to have that. Right. But for the most part, I want to pop back up. <laughs> and then I want to I want to be the key witness in the prosecution because you killed me. You thought I was dead, so you are you are getting charged with murder. It just so happens I'm alive. So So you're going to continually insert yourself in murder scenarios uh-huh. so that you can be the star witness uh-huh. at multiple trials. Yeah. I like it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> because I think Okay, well now now I do need to add another caveat. I oh, would also okay. like to be a little bit of a shapeshifter cuz I don't oh. want I don't want someone to recognize me. That's true. Cuz then the jig is up. No one's going to be Yeah, no one's going to murder you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I need to Oh, that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it becomes sort of mysterious like how many of these people are there? Right. Like, I don't know if I should shoot this person. Oh my she might gosh. just pop back up and be she the might. key oh. witness in my trial. Yeah. Your ability would Stop murder in its tracks because people would be afraid. At at least I think around this area. (laughs) (laughs) In this local vicinity. Yeah. It would stop murder. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like the idea of you being an urban myth too. Just being spread around amongst criminals like Mm -hmm. Batman or something. Yes. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great too. But I, I... to be clear, whoever's designing this, I need the caveat to be swift. So I don't okay. want to like get taken to the hospital and they revive me and that's how I live. Oh, I yeah, mean, no, 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 no. I'm on the floor. The yeah. guy's like, yes. And then I just stand back up. I'm like, okay. Yeah. You know what? I, I was bet. going on vacation and now I have to do a trial. <laughs> this is very inconvenient, yeah, I've murderer. I've seen your face. Yeah. Every detail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get away with shit. No. No. In fact, here's the bullet. I just pulled it out myself. So, sucks to suck. You shot an immortal person. <laughs> okay, so if wow. you could be immortal, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. the thing would be to get more time. Sure, so, sure. is there one thing that you would like to give up just for the sheer fact of how much time it takes away from your life? Uh, yes, and that would be peeing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be urination. Because the amount so of times, fast. the amount of times per day that I have to take bathroom breaks oh. is astounding. Yeah. And I feel like it would add up mm-hmm. probably if I did the math Ooh. of how much time I'm wasting going back and forth to the toilet. Yeah. It's a lot of time. I mean, what's let's let's just do some preliminary. Okay, let's math. do some preliminary. Math. Okay, yeah. so how how what would you say an average amount of time, <sighs> considering the walk to and back and the amount of time? Yeah, I would say at least every hour. Okay. And pro- well, let's guesstimate like a two three minute okay scenario there. Let's go two point five. Okay. Since you said two to three. <laughs> now, so let's say you're, so you're on your phone calculator from eight to yeah. eight. So we would say every hour in there, but then after bedtime, you're, there's probably longer. You're not getting up every hour, are you? Do we have a medical uh, no, emergency? No. Okay. 
<laughs> no, I am awake from seven in the morning till about nine at night. Okay, so we need ten at night, whatever. 15. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we're and doing then the math. Do you get up in the night? No. Okay. I sleep right through, hmm. unless a cat gets on my belly. And that often happens, and then I realize, oh, that hurts because I got to pee. So then I get up and go pee. So I got to double check if I did that right, because that's a lot of time. Is it alarming? I thought it'd be alarming. 212 hours a year. Right? See, that is time that I could use to pursue my passion to make me happy. 2.5 minutes, and we're going to do that 14 times a day. Yeah, at least. Let's just say we'll just even take it to 10. Okay. Just to be conservative. <laughs> okay. Okay. That means 25 minutes a day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Times 365. Yeah. Is 9,125 minutes a year. Uh huh. Divided by 60. That's okay. 152 hours a year. At least. At least. I could use that time. And those are quick. I mean, we went in between. Those are yeah. quick bathroom breaks. Yeah. yeah. 152 hours. So you see what I'm saying? I yeah, I'm sold. I want to do away with urination. I, yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. Somehow redesign the human body so that we don't have to do this. Yeah. And whoever said, "Hey, drink more water," okay, then I am going to be doing double that yes. time at least. I have. There has been multiple times in my life I have tried to increase my water intake, yeah. and I give up by day two because I'm like, I can't pee this much. So much. And it suddenly becomes urgent. Like one minute I don't have to pee. And then the next minute I got to pee. So bad. And thankfully, you know, I live and work in my house. Mm -hmm. My bathroom is just right over there. When I used to work in corporate America, you'd have to take long walks to get to the bathroom. I probably, if I had like one of those step measurement things, I'd probably be walking to the moon and back. Every day. Just to get to the bathroom. Just to get to the bathroom. It's a poor design. It is. Yeah. 152 hours. It's a lot of and time. that's conservative. It's conservative. Beyond urination wow. and peeing, I also would like to give up administrative stuff like doctor visits, dentist visits, mm. all of that, mostly because I hate them. Yeah. No Not good. necessarily to no free up comes time. out of them. Yep. Mm-hmm. All the house maintenance stuff. Ooh, hate yeah. it. Mm-hmm. 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 So I think what I'm asking for is a redesign of the human body as well as mm-hmm. um, a redesign of... So that I don't have to do like I want a house that maintains itself. I want a robot house. Okay, you want a robot house yeah. and sort of a robot body. <laughs> yeah, the ro- okay, at least a robot urethra. Perhaps. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I mean, I I think that this is all g- a good idea. Yeah. I'm on board. I want all the same things. And if I stopped peeing, I would have enough time to do that to figure out how to redesign the human body and make a robot house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So those but, 152 hours are stopping you. From the scientific discoveries that we need in this age <laughs> to move us forward. That's exactly what I meant. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. I mean, if you started taking that times every person. We could solve cancer. We could solve um, the, the climate crisis. We could solve so many things if we stopped peeing. I, yeah. <laughs> I have to say yes. That's all I have to say. I have to say yes. I'm on board. Yeah. And I'm not going to lie. I'm astounded by the amount of time. I know. When you really think about it. I never it. put the time together like yeah. that. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for also reinforcing that, yeah, urination sucks. It does. And it sucks my time away. It does. Our bodies are flawed. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I started thinking of scientific ways to do this, and I realized I don't have that kind of acumen. Why am I even trying? But, but if you stop peeing, well, that's kidney stone. Those are painful. Yeah, that's so not I don't good. want that. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, we'll get there. Yeah, somehow we need to do like bladder replacement surgeries with some sort of stainless steel configuration that somehow like maybe you just empty once a day. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, you you know, so that's a quick process. You know exactly how much time yep. you're spending on mm-hmm. it until we really figure out how to maybe absorb it. Or to somehow make it just vanish. Like your pee comes out of sweat. <laughs> yes. Ooh. Which it probably already does anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean. Yeah. yeah. Thing. Bodies. Bodies mm-hmm. are gross. Mm-hmm. But we have one life. Mm-hmm. And our picks are wondering, what would we do with that? What would we say? It's my life. And my fiction pick is about that. Can I transition us? Yes. Are you still thinking about peeing? I was, but now I'm all in. 
I, I snapped back. We'll and come I'm back to it. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, keep well, thinking, keep ruminating on the inventions that we will come up with. Yes, because if there's to anyone to solve this issue, that's going to have scientific crisis. discovery. It's me. It's definitely me. My fiction pick is called The Wanderers by Meg Howry, mm-hmm. and this came out in 2017. And it's funny that I said it would take uh, the amount of time to walk to the moon because this is about space. Oh, my gosh. Sort of. So. (laughs) (laughs) The emphasis you put on it's about space to end with. Sort of. (laughs) It's about space. (laughs) Sort of. (laughs) Yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. So in The Wanderers, three people have been chosen for a first of its kind mission. A trip to Mars. Mm. And it's a trip planned by a private space company. In a penis-shaped rocket. In a penis-shaped rocket, absolutely. Okay. It's called Prime Space. So insert SpaceX, insert all of the current Prime private space. Ooh. Prime Space, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm sure it's very penile, mm-hmm. the shape of it, yeah. And they've decided, Prime Space, mm-hmm. this private space company, they've decided that before the trip, they're going to put their three astronauts through a 17-month training period and simulation. Okay. They're, so they lock, <laughs> they lock these three people in a warehouse in uh-huh. a simulation, uh-huh. and the idea is that they must learn to survive the stress the mission the mission is going to put on them. Uh, okay, all while being observed mm-hmm. constantly. So the three astronauts are Helen, Yoshi, and Sergey, and Helen had retired from NASA. And she found life outside of going to space just kind of meaningless. She didn't know what to do with herself anymore. Mm. So this opportunity comes along. She's like, fantastic, perfect. This yes. is exactly what I've been looking for. Um, same for Yoshi and Sergey, who are also trying to prove themselves to themselves and also to their families and kind of prove like what their life has been about. Yeah. So we follow the three of them along this time period uh-huh. of strange sort of forced isolation. And we also follow a few of their family members. Helen's daughter, who always felt neglected because she it was she was obviously not her mother's primary concern. Her right. mother's primary concern was space <laughs> and not her. Um, Yoshi's wife, who actually likes him being gone. She likes that arrangement mm. that they have. And then Sergei's son, who is grappling with his identity. All of the astronauts that have been chosen, they are good at their jobs, but in some areas of, li- of their life, not so much. You know, maybe they're not as good when it comes to other people or to their families. So this simulation is a whole different kind of challenge because they're just around these three people, the three of them yeah. constantly. They have no real alone time. It's just constant interaction. And the whole situation feels like a very weird extended job interview because oh. the observers are constantly monitoring them. Right. Not just on the mission parameters, but on, like, if they can take this. So they feel like they're being, you know, like, judged. Yeah. They're not even sure if they're going to get to go to Mars. You know, they need to survive the simulation first. And over time, the stress of that, they start to question what's real. Like, is this, are we in a really, in a simulation? Have we actually gone to Mars? Like, what what is happening here? All sorts of questions oh. from uh, the, the weirdness mm-hmm. of this isolation. And what's the point of all this? So I chose it for this theme because the three of these astronauts, they've been long obsessed and compelled to devote their lives to exploring, to, you know, to to space. And they are keenly aware that they have one life and they've devoted it to what they think is a cause greater than them. But as they engage in this training and this simulation, some of that comes into question. They, They start thinking, should we keep going on this path this is a very this is not really what I thought this was going to be this is very strange this is am I still good at this can I keep going with this Um, and ultimately what makes a life worth living so I I think it's a really cool idea it goes in some really interesting places uh, wonderful writing and like I said it's about space sort of because we don't know we don't know we don't know wow but can you imagine like just the idea of you're going to go on a 17-month journey to Mars, but first you have to do the 17-month simulation to make sure you can manage the 17-month. Yeah. Like, 
it's a lot to ask of a person. Well, and then I was thinking like, okay, yeah, you're being observed. So do they want to see that you can't crack? But then also that might not be natural. So should you crack exactly. sometimes? Like maybe sometimes you should say your real feelings because maybe they want a real person that's like, okay, if she never cracks and at the end she's going right. to totally lose it. Because it's a simulation, they keep throwing challenges to them, you know, like, yeah. oh, this piece of equipment broke and we got to figure out like, what would we do now? You know, that kind of stuff. And because it's so... Because they're being observed, because it feels so real, it, it's, yeah, there's a lot of uh, mental gymnastics going on over Ooh, that. Yeah. I can only imagine. I would never want to be an astronaut. I never wanted Absolutely to be an astronaut. Absolutely not. Even when I was a kid. You no, know how a lot of kids that, wanted yeah. to do that? No. Ooh, no, you don't. No. I mean, I guess the Challenger explosion kind of solved that for a lot of kids. But mm-hmm. it, for me, it was the day. Did you ever have a day where, like, they brought that space food? Maybe I think you tried like familiar. the ice cream that was like dehydrated, and you were like, "I can't handle this." Yeah, I was yeah. like, "What is this? This is food. No. This is what I would have if I went yeah. to space." Okay, hell no! Mm-mm. I have to go to a bunch of schooling before it, and I don't even get real ice cream. You can see where my priorities lay, mm-hmm. and it I is did. not with space. <laughs> <laughs> I did really like the movie Space Camp. Well, in the, in the 80s, yeah, with Leah Thompson, a very young Joaquin Phoenix, mm-hmm. Tate Donovan, uh huh. Where a bunch of high schoolers get sent up to space. Yeah. That's about the extent of my space uh, desire. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's it. I have none. Sure I don't know. like the idea of exploring and being on a boat. Exploring? It yeah. sounds terrible. It sounds, it sounds very buggy. There's going to be a lot of bugs. Now, exploring <laughs> like, hey, this is a whole bunch of like new snacks you've never oh, tried. Oh, hell yeah. This is a bookstore you've never been in. Oh, God, yeah. This is this is a new Lego set that you haven't done before, right? Yeah, those types of things yeah. I'm, I'm about. Yeah. yeah, exploring, but like, hey, new frontier. No nope. one's ever been here. We'd no. like you to explore. Not a chance. If I learned anything from school, oh, it's that the Oregon Trail didn't go well. Uh, that is a that is a fact. So that's yeah. so you get out to the wilderness and things aren't good. No, I want known. I want. Yeah. Quantities that have been discovered already. Sure. And explored. Yeah. And then I get to reap the benefits of that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. I've often thought that if I was like in the Truman Show, like that sh- yes. Jim Carrey, that I'd be great because they'd be like, she's never going to figure this out because she does not do anything different. Yeah. She is very content with this weird little world we built her. It's never occurred to her that this sh- there should be more. Yeah, I'd be okay with that yeah. too. If I got to do the things that I liked every day. Yeah. Great. Once Watch in a while, me. throw a new restaurant in there. I'd be like, huh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be pumped. Okay. <laughs> Simple. Simple. <laughs> well, uh, for my fiction pick this week, it's called Dream Girl by Laura Lippman. Oh. And it was published in June of 2021. And it was on a few lists. Like, it made a few things. And if you're not familiar with Laura Lippman, she has quite a back catalog. Mm-hmm. She's kind of a, you know, mystery, suspense thriller writer. I've read a lot of her stuff. It's all really entertaining. Mm-hmm. Um, this one was just enough different that that's kind of why I picked it. Because it, it took a an interesting place I felt like for the reader. It wasn't your typical twist or turn and there was some kind of grappling with some big issues. Mm -hmm. So Jerry Anderson is a successful author and he suffers a freak accident in this beautiful apartment that he has because of all of his, how well his books have done. So he ends up trapped in a hospital bed for a period of time. Even after he's released, he has to come back home and he can't completely care for himself. He's older, but also he's, you know, recovering from all this with his back, his hip, his legs. So he's in this posh apartment and he has to basically rely on hired help. He already had an assistant, but then he needs like a nurse basically to live in. In the meantime, he's just broken up with this woman who's kind of still obsessed with him and obsessed with the lifestyle he can provide because he has money so now he's really at her will because she can like randomly show up and he's there so he starts to feel like he might be going a little bit crazy when he starts getting strange phone calls in the middle of the night that no one else that is there hears they don't hear the phone ring they don't the phone company has no record of these phone calls and they're talking to him about this book he wrote early on in his career called dream girl like i know who dream girl is i know what you wrote about and he's like i don't i don't even know what you're talking about there is no person he keeps yeah so it's this very like psychological thing or he's like is it the medication what's happening to me his mom died of alzheimer's so he's thinking am i is there something hereditary here 
he also starts to have visitors that no one else seems to oh, see. Oh, boy. As it progresses. So as this is happening, it's bringing up a flood of memories for him. And he's starting to relive bits and pieces of his life. And he starts to kind of keep a catalog and realize like, oh, there might be more than one person who might not want to see me do well. Like I might have, you know, done some damage. Oh, might have pissed a few people off. Yes. So we go on this crazy ride with Jerry through his life, through a bunch of his questionable decisions and the path that basically led to this hospital bed. And I tell you, it's twisty. It's dark. um, It it has some shadows of kind of... uh, me too and consent it has discussions of success and what that means for some people and how some people don't like it when other people get it oh yeah um and it's very very immersing like you feel very caught up in this because it's really all taking place in this apartment and he's reliving this all trying to figure out what's going on at the heart of everything so i picked it for this theme this week because he always knew he wanted to be a writer. Like this was the thing he wanted to do. And he was willing to sacrifice everything for it. He sacrificed relationships, children, everything, because he thought it was the most important thing to do this. He he wanted to always keep himself in that crowd, producing more work and getting the accolades for it. So he's kind of built a very small world for himself. And I think sometimes that is what happens when we become so singularly focused on one thing or Mm -hmm. one goal that we think we have to achieve. We sort of block out everything else and it becomes very small. And it that can sometimes be looked as great, like, oh, they were so focused on this thing and they did all this good work. But it can also be very disappointing and unfulfilling because Mm -hmm. you let all these other things go. So Mm. it's an interesting, I think it has an interesting theme about the balance of goals in life and how much are you willing to sacrifice to achieve them? Yeah. And it's twisty and dark. Ooh. And you got to like a character that you don't entirely trust. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So mm-hmm. you've read a lot of Laura Littman. I have, yeah. Her. I mean, like early on, I think um, I discovered her a long time ago. And her, it's, you know what her uh, books are great for, and I meant to say this, is like if you have someone who likes to read but they don't know where to start or like if you are looking for good book recommendations for someone they're very gripping and they're very um interesting and they really they have a lot of social themes and Mm -hmm. things like that but they're also quick i mean it's propulsive so it really gives somebody that kind of bite of what reading can be like like a story that you want to keep going and Mm -hmm. find out what's happening i feel like that's a good way to hook people in sometimes absolutely and to open up to more stuff but yeah i've i've recommended her books quite a few times especially for people who say like you know i just don't have a lot of time but i really Mm -hmm. like it you know books that are entertaining but i never pick the right one when i go to the store i always think she's a good jumping off point this one i would say is a little bit different than most of her catalog although i still would recommend it in the same vein it's very yeah it's it's a pretty universal story Mm -hmm. trapped in an apartment Maybe losing his mind. Yes. And maybe not a great guy. No. Gotta love that. No. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, so my other genre pick is a graphic memoir, nonfiction, mm. hybrid kind of thing. Okay. It comes from Kristen Radke. Mm. And if you remember, I recommended her other book, Imagine Wanting Only This. Yeah. And this book came out last year. It's called Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness. And the book starts with the idea that there is a silent epidemic, Mm -hmm. how she calls it, of loneliness. It's not something we're supposed to talk about Mm. or admit. It's a shameful thing if you admit that you're lonely and it's or it's seen as a character flaw. But it's everywhere. It's affecting everyone. And she what's fascinating is she wrote this prior to the pandemic. Wow. So I I think in the last year or two alone, Mm -hmm. this has become a very different conversation. But a lot of this is so painfully relevant as you read it with this pandemic experience. Right. Um, so she looks at the idea and the history of loneliness. She looks at it through the lens of technology, like the invention of the laugh track to make us feel less lonely, to the rise of Instagram. Mm-hmm. And she looks at it through science, like what it does to our bodies and through culture, like how the stories told we tell in America about competition and what it means to be successful sort of sets us up to be singular and lonely. Mm -hmm. And the author looks at why 
why we try to connect with each other first and, and what we're looking for and why we struggle with it, why we're lonely, why we won't talk about it. She kind of comes at it from every angle with some personal stories and also with just some scientific and cultural analysis too. And like I said, she wrote this years ago before the pandemic and she was looking at the world before all of that. But because it was released last year, I think it hit really hard. It's a very, very uh, topical concern. Yeah. I think we were starting to consider it, talk more about it. And I chose it for this theme because, you know, the idea of we have one life to live, but the ways that our modern life are, is set up and our American culture may be making that life not as fulfilling and full as mm-hmm. we want it to be. Mm-hmm. And what I got from this, too, is that life is, you know, too short and singular to not talk about this stuff, right. like to be shamed about something that a lot of people experience and I think that that's probably one of her points as well is that you know to feel less alone about this and of course it's told with beautiful graphics and illustrations and it's just a it's a great read and something that uh, is fascinating to think about with the experience of the last two years right that we've had yeah absolutely that's crazy that she wrote it before the pandemic and then it comes out I mean Yeah, she's been working on this, I think, or she started it in 2016. Wow. And I mean, just thinking about all the different things that we're talking about that maybe we weren't talking about then, like, you know, the the manosphere and how all these very lonely men are going to, you know, these hate sites and everything and getting radicalized Mm -hmm. or the ways that, you know, just city life can make you lonely and or even being with people for the wrong reasons can make you very very lonely yeah Yeah. absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of ways that loneliness manifests just outside of the the traditional like on truly just alone yeah you know yeah Mm -hmm. and you know like i said i think there's a bit of stigma too about like being alone mm-hmm. versus being lonely and what the differences are there. And I've, I've long kind of talked about that because I have long preferred to live alone. Mm-hmm. But loneliness does not automatically come with that idea. Like, right. you, know, you know what I right. mean? So, yeah. But people often want to connect because yes. they don't necessarily experience loneliness in the same way or they don't see being alone as the yeah. same. Like they automatically meet, use those two words interchangeably. Alone absolutely. and loneliness. Yeah. yeah. Two different things. Two very different things. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, my nonfiction pick is, it's a weird one. Oh. I'm going to tell you that. But I really think that everyone, I, across the board, you're going to like it. It's called How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question oh. <laughs> by Michael Schur. Who, Thanks, Michael. I need this. Yes. It was published in January 2022. And if that name sounds familiar, it should. He's the creator of The Good Place. Oh, and yeah. And writer. Yeah. Tons of writing credits. So basically what happened is that when he had the idea for The Good Place, he started doing all this research on philosophical, moral, ethical ideas, which if you've seen The Good Place, you know that that's what it centers sure. around. Yeah. And that they'll often do different philosophies or talk about different things. So he had all this research and all this stuff swimming in his head and he thought you know what I'm going to put it in a book and he thought this but how do I do this how do I put it in a book that makes it interesting like because some of this stuff is weighty and Mm -hmm. heavy so it might sound like terrible at first pass but truly actually I found like it was exactly what I needed right now because I feel like we're all sort of sort of coming out of the pandemic but everything still feels like garbage yeah. like everything just feels like garbage like you go out in the world and people are garbage and mm-hmm. things are garbage and it just nothing feels right and that might be a symptom that we're all dealing with post you know the pandemic it might just be how life is right now but i felt like the way that he took some of these moral questions and broke it down. I thought it was going to be too heavy. I thought I'm not going to end up finishing this book, but I want to try it. And no, I I tore through it because it was thinking about things in a different way was almost hopeful or gave like a little bit of optimism. Hmm. Like, okay, maybe some of it's my perspective too. Like if I change and look at it this way, maybe not everyone's as terrible as I think. Or maybe (laughs) we're not all destined to burn in hell. Like Uh uh there's other, you know. So he breaks down these really difficult moral questions like, 
Can we enjoy great art when it's created by really terrible people? It is an excellent question. And how do we do that backwards when mm -hmm. we already enjoyed it and loved it and then we find out after the fact? And it gives these philosophical answers based on lots of different schools of thought with really easy to understand and hilarious examples. Like he starts with, should you punch your friend in the face? <laughs> and we go through the moral <laughs> implications of that. And then should you punch your friend in the face if this or that? Uh -huh. Should you? So it goes through all of those things. And it... It was funny the way he wrote it. He's very funny. It was really enlightening. He also has a doctor of philosophy that weighs in sometimes and puts little side notes in. Um, I did a combo on this one. I read it and listened to it on Ooh. audio. And I would recommend that you do the audio because it has cameos from all the actors <gasps> in The Good Place. Oh, my gosh. Where they do little sides and they explain the philosophy or they act out something. Uh -huh. So it's great. And he reads part of it. And his delivery, because he wrote it, is fantastic. And it really added to some of the humor of it. I picked it this week because I feel like we're all struggling a little bit to give life meaning right now. We're all sort of struggling with what's right, what's wrong. I, I feel like when things are so bad, you have this tendency to kind of look inward and it makes you start to feel selfish. Like I, because all you can handle is, is what you know and what yep. you're looking at. And then you start to feel like, well, I don't have a very good worldview or I'm not helping or I'm not moving us forward or you know it, our decisions i'm doing damaging things for future generations and it starts to get too much but and I, it's weird to think that a book that talks about these things is helpful but it really truly is because it kind of gives it this idea that these are questions that people have been grappling with for centuries mm -hmm. this isn't new uh in context of some of the things that's happening around us it's interesting to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives and think about how you've heard people argue different things and how that kind of fits into maybe their school of thought and it was funny and sometimes you just need a good laugh yeah i thought two things when you were uh describing this one how good the good place was yes and i need to rewatch it because i never saw the final season and just how brilliantly it did bring in all this philosophy stuff while still making you laugh. Mm -hmm. I heard someone that uh, talked about a review of this book and said that they actually uh, did a minor in philosophy in college. Uh -huh. And they felt like this book did such a good job like that. These are things that they would send suspend semesters on. Wow. And he did such a good job of dissecting it and describing it to, in such a great, interesting way that it was easy to grasp. Maybe philosophy students across the land will be assigned to this book. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know if you remember this episode um, of The Good Place with the, like, should I ki should we run over one person to yes. save a whole train? Yes, I was train? just thinking about that yeah. one, yeah. He breaks that down in wow. a bunch of different ways and where that came from uh -huh. and where that idea for that uh, episode came from. And so even if you just like The Good Place, there's a lot of interesting stuff in there about that too. But if you like it, you're going to like this book because yeah. it, it's almost like a hand in hand thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. My second thought was that you're spot on about just the world is garbage right. and people are garbage. And so it's nice to, yeah, get mm -hmm. books like this. I'm thinking a lot about the idea of people are garbage because I may have jury duty tomorrow. As we've discussed, it yeah. feels like the epitome of people are garbage. And it feels like it's almost like a slap in the face after two years of pandemic to be introduced, reintroduced into being a, uh, a citizen mm -hmm. by going to maybe sit in a government office mm -hmm. and be surrounded by annoyed, pissed off people. Yeah. I'm just yeah. picturing a long extended DMV scenario. Well, and the problem is, is that. You're not going to get dismissed because you, you're rational and logical. And that's going to, that kind of, it's going to backfire. It's that permeates off people who are rational and logical. Yeah. And then you're like, well, that's both sides are going to say, Ugh. well, I need a rational, logical person. I know. And understand. you and I have discussed multiple ways of getting out of this. And it just, nothing really is going to work, I don't think. No. Yeah. I think the closest we came was you just adamantly saying that you slept with one of the lawyers. Like, <laughs> I know that he was one of my one night stands. I know it. I recognize him. I know it. Even if he denies it, be like, that's yeah. what I figured you would that's say. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then clearly they'd be like, okay, well, she's a little unhinged. I yeah. Think we can I could do her. that. I could, I could yeah. try that. Mm -hmm. I really liked your idea too of trying to dress the podca podcasts up as judicial figures yeah and then showing it off to the yes. selection committee i think tomorrow. you have to be too eager yeah you yeah. can't be too un -eager. i really want to get on this trial uh -huh. really I've really really forever. look at look at look at my cat <laughs> look at yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i like that <laughs>
I think yeah. Yeah, it's a possibility. I like that idea of your book, though, as being a remedy to garbage. It is. And I know that seems weird because it seems like it would be a heavy book. And I'm not saying it's easy reading. Don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. But it is entertaining enough that it's not going to feel like work. I like it. Yeah. And how can you deny a book called How to Be Perfect? <sighs> And that's what I love. He's so tongue in cheek the whole time. He's like, you're going to have all the answers at the end of this book. <laughs> like, just keeps promising it. <laughs> like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, my pop culture pick deals with some weighty Ooh. stuff mm-hmm. about life, too. It's called The Tourist from HBO Max. OK. You may have seen it being pushed at you. It has Jamie Dornan. OK. That's where it I was going to say. Came out, but, yeah, yeah. It came mm-hmm. out, I think, like a month or two ago. OK. It's got Jamie Dornan, mm-hmm. Danielle McDonald. Mm-hmm. And the show starts with there's a car racing through the Australian outback, and it's pursued by a semi. Ooh. And oh. there's a crash. And the the person in the car is an Irish man, and he's driving the car. He's eventually found, and he's sent to a small hospital. And at the hospital, he discovers he remembers nothing. Not his name, not why he's here. Oh, no. Nothing. Oh, no. And at the hospital, a young constable from the small town that he's in, Helen Chambers, shows up. And it's her first real police action. So she's excited. She's gung-ho. She's going to take this report. But then she realizes he has no information to give her Ah. because he doesn't remember anything. And But, you know, she... She feels badly for him. She thinks he he's a very nice guy. So she offers herself his help if he needs it and jokes, you know, like I'm the only person in the world that, you know, kind of. thing. Yeah. The only clue to who he is is a piece of paper that he finds um, instructing him to go to a diner at a specific time, oh. which he does and is nearly blown up in the process. From there, it is a story of tons of like twists and turns Ooh. as he tries to figure out who he is and why violence is seeming to follow him. Yeah. And along the way, we meet a woman who says they had a relationship, a super creep who drives a semi and wears cowboy boots, an asshole of a fiance to the cop, a Greek drug lord. And lots of well-meaning and some not so well-meaning folks that just get caught up in the wake. Oh. All in the Australian outback. Wow. It's a wild ride. It's funny. It's dark. It's touching. There's lots of really important questions like you were talking about. And I chose it for the scene because I think the tourist, which is what he's known as, uh, may be getting a do-over. At first, he's desperate to discover who he is. He's, you know, he wants to find out like what he doesn't remember. But right. as things progress, he's wondering like, Maybe I don't want to know oh, because this yeah. weird shit happening around me points to some bad shit that maybe I did or that I was involved in or something. Right. Also, the cop, Helen, is engaged, like I said, to a real asshole. He's very controlling, but she's not seeing it. And as she meets the tourists, though, and gets involved more and more in the case, she's realizing she has one life and maybe it should be different, Mm -hmm. you know. So I think this is about discovery and reinvention, trying to figure out what to do with your life with a few wild weirdos. And there's a great LSD trip thrown in there. Uh, I loved the characters. I loved the way that you know, the, the directions it went in. It's only six episodes. I'm not sure if there's going to be more. The ending kind of could go either way. Okay. Yeah. And Jamie Dornan is fantastic. And I've been, like, I think I always liked him, but after Barb and Star, I'm a super fan. Yeah. You so, should be. Cause yeah. That was great. And yeah, he's, uh, it's, it goes places you don't expect. Twisty, Twisty and fun. It sounds great. I didn't know anything about it. Like, I had seen it, but I hadn't. You know, like gripped in enough to know. So now I do. And yeah. now I will watch it. I think it. you would like it. Mm-hmm. Well, for my pop culture this week, I brought you a little six episode podcast. Oh. It's put out by Wondery. Okay. Hosted by Stephanie Beatrice, which you might oh, know. Oh, yeah. From Brooklyn, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Nine-Nine. Called Twin Flames. Twin Flames. Yes. Whew. This is about Jeff and Shalia, Shalia, who start our YouTube videos. Um, about finding your twin flame and your twin flame is not the same as your soulmate a twin flame is someone who literally your soul's been cut in half i already hate this i hate it you should you should two in one so there's this soul's been cut in two you find them bring them back together so they decide that they're these love gurus and they set out to help everyone find their twin flame oh this is gross right And we get to find out all of this information about Jeff, like where it started from, kind of how he went off the deep end and now with his wife and they're doing these videos. And I don't know if anyone saw this coming. This will be a shock. 
it basically turns into a cult. What? Yeah, where they're just giving all this money to fund their lifestyle. I would have never expected that. Right? Yeah. So the whole idea is that this... To find your twin flame, you have to unblock yourself. You have to be willing to do anything. Oh, God. And by anything, I mean you should probably stalk someone. If they oh. if they are triggered by you, like they don't want to be around you, it's because that's how much they love you. What? Yeah. So they're sending these people out in the world to commit <gasps> crimes, basically. I mean, women got arrested. And they talked to a guy in the podcast who went on like one date with this woman and then she kept following him and what his life was like because of it. Shouldn't your twin flame want to be with you too? No. No. They're blocked. They're blocked. Oh. Okay. Okay. Sure. Because they, Jeff, they have a direct line to what the divine world wants. Of course So if they tell them who your twin flame is, then that's who it is. So Wait, for, so they're telling the people they who their give, twin flame? Sometimes they get messages and say, oh, no, no, <gasps> that's your twin flame. Sometimes people come to the group and say, is this my twin flame? And this is, I'm not saying that this is like, hey, they're on a commune and like you get sucked in by a cult. This is like a Facebook group that then you pay to take these videos and they're they're going after people who are lonely, vulnerable. Oh, God. Maybe the dating apps aren't working. They're looking for something. And, like, and they're looking for a reason why they're unhappy, too. And they're willing to believe that it's them. Oh, that it's no. their own selves that are blocking their own happiness. They convince a woman to start identifying as a man so that she can be with this other woman who's her twin flame. Uh Okay. And had no desire to do that. I'm not, that's all fine and good if that's what your desire is. Why couldn't she stay a woman and be with the woman? Okay. Right. Yeah, it's fine. Right. It's fine. Right. Because the other woman didn't identify as lesbian or gay. Sure, sure, sure. That's the only thing stopping them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, so many issues on so many levels. You're going to be so annoyed, but it's also (laughs) so entertaining. I don't even know what to say. This whole idea is just bananas and it's taken off i mean these people are still doing this they're still it's cultish in the sense that like once you're in the group they don't want you associating with people outside of the group (sighs) they suck you into these positions that are not paid but take up tons of your time counseling other people with no real you know ability to do that yeah once you find your twin flame and you are actually things are good you're you're said to be in harmonious union so if you're one of those couples then you know you then you counsel other people of how to get to harmonious union all why jeff and his wife are buying porsches and living the life based on all this money that these people are spending on these courses Now, if you're a Megan Fox Machine Gun Kelly fan, you might have heard that she has frequently said that Machine Gun Kelly is her twin flame. And he recently released a song called Twin Flame. I don't know how much is related, but people have connected the dots. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. So... Again, so did she stalk him? Is that what we're saying? I don't know. She just said that as soon as she met him, she knew that their souls had been one and that this was it's different than a soulmate because (laughs) you can have more than one soulmate, apparently. What? Yeah, you can have more than one soulmate in your life, but you only have one twin flame. Okay, you're just making you're just making up words now at this point. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. And like they have recordings of some of these like sessions where they're like this lady's like i don't know like he said he wanted to see me and then we we had a picnic for his birthday and then he didn't want to talk to me anymore and then i realized that he left his drill in my car and so i said you know i'm gonna come over and bring it and he was like don't and they're like why are you letting him stop you why are you letting him dictate what you do i mean like i mean there's a woman that's in jail for stalking because that's she took the information and went with it this is so Uh uh-huh gross and fascinating and i think one of the biggest things one of my biggest takeaways is there's always a weird red flag about a guru right Uh, yeah at least one and the first one it's always something that you're like if taken out of context you would just never buy in for me with jeff it was that he spent a year eating hot dogs nope one whole year only eating hot dogs jeff that that is a wonderful metaphor for the ways that you're messed up, my friend. I, why, and why that food? Of all the that foods food? that you would choose to eat for a year alone. Th- there's so many things wrong with what you just said, Erin. I know. 
I, and I'm still, I'm struggling. Like, I don't think that that was a widely known fact pre this podcast because they talked to like some older friends of his and stuff that were like, yeah, we saw him kind of go this weird direction and we're like, nah. And one of them was like, he lived with me and all he ate was hot dogs for one whole year. And I was like, that is, Can you know you how like the... there's a checklist for psychopaths? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That should be on that it. That should be on it. Yeah. Also, can you imagine just what hit the inside of his body looked right? like after that? It's got to be just decay. Just. It's just got to be. Just things falling just apart. A, a rotten desert of yeah. broken uh-huh. hearts. Like an old ruin of a temple. Yes. Just things falling just and breaking. Just vultures in and there. dirt. And just. It's bad. <laughs> it's bad. Well, that sounds terrifying and wonderful it's so interesting i had heard nothing about this me neither and i just i felt for the people they they have um one of the people that kind of got sucked into it is throughout the six episodes talks a lot about her journey she was the one that they tried to convince and i just feel as though it is i think that we're we're fascinated by cults kind of by the same reason of true crime like we want to believe that we're not gonna We would never fall for that. Absolutely. So we like to know it from beginning to end so that we can like see it coming. Uh But I, this one to me seemed really kind of underhanded. Yeah. Like a Facebook group. It's something that like you're trying to improve yourself. You think you're improving yourself. For sure. You're not moving. You're not changing jobs. You're not, you're just like, hey, I don't feel fulfilled in my love life. I'm going to try this thing because these things haven't been working. So in a way you have the right idea. Like I'm going to do something different. Just see. And then you fall into this group and then you pay money to take these courses. And then the next thing you know, you're being told to stalk people. <laughs> and and you might believe like, well, I haven't been successful. So maybe that's what's been stopping me yeah. is I don't pursue hard enough. Yikes. And then you have these sick, harmonious, harm, harmonious union couples that are like, well, we had to. Yeah, it took us a long time to get together, too. Uh, yeah. I think it starts, too, with like the just the fallacy of the idea of soulmate too. the things that we're told things that we tell each other and are told about like what love is and what connection is and and people can take advantage of that shit if you're if you believe in it yeah Mm -hmm. so in summary yeah i this is my last podcast (laughs) because i am going to find my twin flame so. so Mike isn't your twin flame? <laughs> Apparently oh, not. Mike. Oh, bummer. No. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he would be, but mainly because I know that if I tried to eat hot dogs for a year, he would be like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I know he's my twin flame because yeah. he would say, that's dumb. Knock it off. Also, the fact that he would hate being called your twin flame. He. With a fiery passion. Yes. In fact, I, he probably right now, he feels itchy and he doesn't yeah. know why. Yeah. It's because you're talking about miles this. away, I'm saying that he's my twin flame. He's like, something doesn't feel right. Nope. Nope. Like, nope. I don't even know what she's saying, but I don't it's, know what it's she's gross. saying, but it's I gross. don't like it. Nope. Mm-hmm. Also, oh, oh, this is a bit of an update from a few episodes Ooh, ago. Okay. Where we discussed the fact that Mike likes to watch things without yes. me. Yes. So we happened to hear that episode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he was enraged and wanted to defend himself. Oh. By saying that I don't make it clear which things that I do and don't want to watch. And that when left to his own devices, it's not fair for me to say, you can't watch that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So is his theory that he would be better off with like a written list? Like you need to write a list of like what? That's what he says. I don't believe in theory that that's true. I see. Okay. I think it sounds like he was enraged because there was a bit of truth in that. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because what's really at the heart of this is sometimes he doesn't (laughs) listen. So I'll be like, hey, I really want to see that show. He has no memory of that because he wasn't taking in the information. Yeah. Yeah. That's really what is at the heart of this. But I think... You know what? I'm his twin flame, so I brought it to you. <laughs> I brought his argument. Here it is. And there you go. I'm glad that we gave him, you know, mm-hmm. some sound time. Yeah. I so didn't offer could... to have him come and defend himself because uh, no. nobody needs that. No. But, but I do think at some point we still need to have Mike come in and talk about something. Yeah. I'm not sure what yet. Some kind of what we need to do is have Mike come in and talk about pop culture throwbacks because he's about 15 That's years right. behind everyone yes. else. Mm-hmm. I feel remember he watched Lost. Yeah. Years after other people. And was talking about it to people like it was new. Right. Yeah. With no understanding that it was old. Like, mm-hmm. hey, did you see the end of Lost? And people are like, 
what? 10 years ago? Yeah. Is there yeah. a reboot? Like, uh-huh. you know, which is a fair question in this day and age. Yes. No, there's not. It's mm. just Mike just saw it. He's watch out people because he's just now watching The Sopranos. So that's coming at you. <laughs> just which is, in fact, what, 25 years old? Yes. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. it is dated. Well, so yeah. So wait till he gets to that ending. He's going to want to talk boy. about that yes, with someone. Yes, he will. Uh huh. And we won't really want to talk to him about it. No. No. No, that's what's sad for him is yeah. he just feels unfulfilled. Because <laughs> who wants to relive that? We got new things. <laughs> God love him. Oh. Uh. Well, following up on a recommendation you made last time, Pam and Tommy, I watched that right afterwards and found everything you said to be absolutely on point. It was devastating and awesome. And there were a few moments where I had to text you with just crying laughing emojis because I didn't expect like an animatronic penis. Yes. To talk to him. Yes. Yeah, I know. Which, by the way, I found out is the voice of Jason Mansukis, who comedian like in everything yeah right? i saw a clip of seth rogan saying like yeah he was our only choice for that voice i don't know what it says about him but that's who we wanted that blew my mind for some reason yes it that did he was the too. talking penis yeah it blew my mind because i just realized i didn't even get to the point where i was like whose voice is that i didn't I either was i was just so, so flummoxed yes it is by the idea don't let that scare you away no. because that series has a lot to offer outside of It really of that, does. There's but... just a very like one minute sight gag thing yeah. that I just could not believe was happening. Uh-huh. It makes sense in the story. It but, does. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. It does actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is a good one. Fantastic show. It is. So well done. Yeah. Love it. So many uh, sleazy, sleazy dudes. <sighs> so many. So many. So many. People are garbage. They really are. Yeah. People are garbage. Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down. People so it's your garbage. life. And remember that people are garbage. That's what we brought you today. That's what so. we brought you. And hey, if I have to do jury duty, I will bring stories next time. You better. Yeah. I'm a, I, I mean, don't want to be jury foreman again. I don't want to do it. And I don't want to be on a diamond patent trial. I want I, something that's less rich white dude. I want if mm-hmm. I have to if I have to sit through mm-hmm. something, I don't want a big murder trial either. I got to be honest with you. I don't think that's going to work out for you. You don't? I feel like if you get on a jury, you are going to be the foreman. Fuck. You're probably right. Because no one else will volunteer. And I'll be like, fine. You got to get going because you got to get out of there at some point. So you're just going to have to speed up the process. At least this time I won't be 26 or whatever I was. So I'll be a little, you know, smarter about things. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll update you all. We will. All of you. When we come back, we'll have a new theme. Yeah, we will. We'll have great picks. Yeah. We'll have we'll more have pop stories. culture fun. And we we'll, might have some jury stories. So. We might. If, that if not, we'll have other stories. Yeah, always. Yeah. In the meantime. Happy reading. Happy reading.